say that the uh, birth of, of Zenkud is an apocryphal story, that the birth of Zenkud is because uh, Mahatasaba is the uh, chief disciple of the and uh, one day all the monks gathered around for a uh, ceremony. Uh, we were sat there and with everybody all the flowers. And there was a the <laughs> Mahakasa, but that moment got it. Uh, it's a, a simple direction about We have those throughout our life. We have those moments throughout our life. Um, for, for me, one of the moments was much important. Of all things, and it was a very profound that. Um, but it's perfect because now I watch it quite a bit. <laughs> it's good, I like it, but I don't get it. I mean, it was a profound moment. I wept, I and mean, I was watching that show, and I wept, and I wept for a few hours. Ah, like, have those throughout our lives. Ah. Uh, today's uh, Dharma discussion is uh, really about the, the second noble truth. So, the first noble truth is that life is dukkha. And, and, and it's mostly translated into English suffering. Uh, but that's kind of a it's an okay translation, but it doesn't have all the nuances that come in Dukkha. Um, there are all kinds of things that we can say about it. Uh, security, frustration, angst. Uh, says that it's a practice And then that that dukkha, that that disappointment, is driven by the second noble, the second nobling. That's that our suffering is caused by what attachment or aversion, <laughs> expectation. Um, in the in the Pali, it says tanha. Tanha a lot of times. Translate as crazy. And anybody who has any addiction understands crazy. I don't care if you're an addict, an addict, or an addict. <laughs> um, the actual translation is probably closer to first. And I think that's an important kind of, from uh, being a poet, I think that's an important word, is important. Because how long can you live without food? Yeah, I mean, up to 30. You don't die at 30, but you can live a long time without food. We could all in this here go two, three days, four days, five days, 
kind of suck, but we, we'd be okay. How long can we go without water? Three's maximum, two, ideally. Once you start getting into three, your fingers shut down, your body shut down. So I think that comparison is important because closer, the word is closer to thirst. Because when your body is getting close to shutting down, it needs it. So it's that intensity. So when I say attachment, or you hear this idea of clinging, Attachment in Buddhism, craving in Buddhism. What are some of the things that come to your mind? What are the first things that come to your mind? Okay, good. What else? I can tell you what I first thought when I came across Buddhism. Well, I like my attachment. My craving's good. I'm a poet. I write love poems. I mean, without that, I'm like, oh, gee, what kind of love poem is that? I really love you, but I'm not attached. <laughs> what else? Tap in. Materialistic. You guys are all sounding like Buddhists. What about before you're a Buddhist? Or even when you're feeling less Buddhist? Sucks. Desperation. Drugs. Terrifying. Yeah, I mean, if you're an addict, you. Understand your addictive behavior. It's terrifying. Okay? Consequences. What are some of the things we're attached to? People. People. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody who lived through the 80s, we all know about codependency, mm -hmm. don't we? <laughs> over and over again. Are you codependent? I'm not codependent. You're codependent. I'm not codependent. We got to the point where we're not dependent on anything. Other, another unhealthy, unskilled. What else? Religion. Religion. Nah. Mm -hmm. You know why do you think we have Judeo Christian and Buddhist terrorists? There are Buddhist terrorists. Right? Go to Sri Lanka. Right? <coughs> Buddhism is not free of its share of delusion and. Suffering and <coughs> harming other people. What else? Outcome. outcome. That's your outcome. Yep. What else? Come on, the obvious one. Love. Control. Oh, control. Starbucks. <laughs> okay. How about your sense of self? You attached to that? Do you cling to that? Your stories? Do you cling to your stories? I'm not talking about the nice one. Because we cling to the nice one. I'm always, I'm always conflicted when you go to some some um, like retreat and they say, tell me about the things about yourself that you love. Okay? Which I think is an important practice. But I think the challenge with that is that just can perpetuate attachment to that story. And that story may not even be something you like about yourself. It's something that your mother liked about you. Or your father or your grandmother. Or your lover that you still miss so dear. And how about the stories we're attached to that we carry with us every day about our self worth, about our inherent value, our stories of self hate? Do we get attached to those things? Think about the condition of our public discourse within our nation. You say we're addicted and attached to certain things. Ideas, concepts, labels, points of view. Attachment to knowing that we know, that we even know. Um, one of the things I want to say is that when I first came to this idea of attachment and, and clinging and the cause of suffering, uh, the, the romantic in me, of course, was challenged a little bit by that, probably because I was very attached to the suffering that went along with my I was actually addicted to suffering. Um, 
But Buddhism does not mean we don't love, and it does not mean we don't love passion. It just means we're not attached to that. Okay? And I love this quote from um, Dzogchen Hanlop. He says, love is when you are thinking, how can I make you happy? Attachment is when you are thinking, why aren't you making me happy? I think that is important. So I want you to take a second to think in your own life. Right now, what are you attached to? The person that comes to my job, I'll say it. Okay. What am I attached to? The person, the person. You can be attached to fear. You can be attached be attached to material objects, but more so with the material objects, we can be attracted to or attached to what they represent, how they fit into our story and see that what we are. I want to share with you uh, an old Zen story, and we've shared this before. Um, and this is specifically about a certain type of and it's attachment to or perspective or bias. And um, once a long time ago, there was a Zen master, and um, people from far and near would see him. They'd ask for his wisdom and his insight. And many would come and ask them, ask him, teach them, to enlighten them in the ways of the Buddha away and seldom turned away regardless of that intelligence or that. One day a very important man came to see the, the man. A man who used to command um, and who demanded command and obedience from those around him. came and he says to the master I have come today to ask you to teach me, teach me about Zen. Open my mind to enlighten me. The tone of the man's voice was one of importance and getting what he usually demanded. The Zen master smiled and said that he uh, that they should discuss the matter over a cup of tea. When the tea was served and the master poured the visitor a cup, he poured and he poured and he poured, and the tea rose up to the rim cup began to flow over. Um, and then finally on to the robes of the wealthy man. Finally, the visitor, the visitor shouted at the master, you're spilling the tea all over. You're getting it all over me. Uh, can't you see that the cup is overfilling, that the cup is full? The master stopped pouring and smiled at his guest. He said, you are like this cup, cup of tea, so full that nothing more can be added. Come back to me when the cup is empty. That's So Seth uh, Duiho Siegel, um, a Zen priest, teaches, um, we can become attached to all kinds of beliefs about how life is supposed to be. Life is supposed to be easy, or at least not so hard. Life is supposed to be fair, or at least not this fair. Bad things are not supposed to happen to me. I should be a further ahead of life. This shouldn't have happened to me. I'm not supposed to be ill. I'm not supposed to be sick. Why am I handicapped? Why am I Raising children or working for a living or marriage shouldn't be this hard. Other people should appreciate more. I should be better, smarter, braver, more loving, and more perfect. These are all attached.
Um, I think it's important to understand that a view or a perspective is not just a collection of propositions, nor is it um, a factually dynamic position, but they tend to be um, charged emotional interpretations of experience. Which intense with which which who with which whose intensity shapes and affects our thoughts, our sensations, our how we interact. Anin uh, has written that we don't see the world as it is, but we see the world as we are. In addition, views have this pernicious tendency to reinforce themselves, even in the face of contradicting it. And think what we do. Think about what we do in our lives, media. Um, we self segregate. We have a tendency to self segregate and only hear or entertain views. That we have. I really like her, but she thinks like I do. That is just the that Having a proper mental attitude regarding views is healthy and an important part of the Buddhist path. We want to have an attitude of intimate not knowing. What Shunru Suzuki called the beginner's mind. He used to say that in a beginner's mind there are many possibilities, in an expert there are none. So, what does it mean to you to have this intimate not knowing? This beginner? What does it mean? Yeah. So, how do we manifest that openness, especially an openness on perspective views? How do we manifest? That? What do you mean? I I trying to listen to what someone is saying without having uh, without running the reply. You know, without actively. So would you say some of our strongest fixed views are how we see other people? Yeah. Elaborating on that, you could have to be able to look at it. Say that I think most of the time we're actually looking at me like it's such a dumb act, not even mad, right? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and, oh, yeah. and that's the whole point is oh, yeah. is being okay with not either seeing differently or like being okay with that that person is. Yeah. Like, and, and that's the important struggle. They can see like, why. That's why. I feel like crazy for that girl. Is it? And it just feels like that is the, the heart of this perspective <laughs> without judgment. Um, it is very hard to find Uh, I won't necessarily make those pictures of drama, but say, hey, I noticed that I'm really not mm -hmm. And I don't think it's so, Take it to that, you know, it's all good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's not first. Yeah. I would almost push back and say that it is a misperception that if you're somebody, we're saying it's all okay, it's all yeah. good. And that it's not. Uh, we, we say in our, our affirmation mm -hmm. about passion there is no judgment, there is no blame, there is no respect. The only concern is for suffering. 
and those who work in nonviolent communication always emphasize that deepest passion is not the solution to the problem, it is what opens the door to the solution to the problem. And sometimes mm -hmm. even, well, if we just listen to each other, everything will be great. <laughs> How many of you have been through mediation? That didn't work out. <laughs> okay. So it, it, I think it's important that before we can even get to a resolution, we can get to uh, any type of reconciliation, we have to start with that, that deep listening, that part of deep listening, the intimate not knowing, that I don't know. Um, and I think it's good to even say that sometimes for ourselves. You're an idiot. But I don't really know. That is my impression. That's where I'm. That's what I'm feeling. But I don't know. Um, and it's not this idea that we stop being who we are and we stop having opinion. We just start letting go of our attachment to those opinions, okay? uh, so that we can actually start having that dialogue. Um, one of the things we're going to do this summer is we're going to do. Um, um, project where we go out to farmer's market on a Saturday and we just listen to all the signs say free rent. That's all we do. And somebody comes up and they can talk. What are you doing? Listen. They can talk about and they will talk about things that you completely disagree with. And then listening is not about agreeing or disagreeing. It's about listening. It's about hearing somebody. Maybe understanding where their perspective what created this point of view? Where did it arise from? Because these don't come in a vacuum. They come from our translating an experience, our giving meaning to an experience. And if we monolithically put somebody, well, there's somebody who thinks that, and anybody who thinks that is insane and crazy, there is no dialogue and there is no opportunity for. Um, so the beginner's mind. We want to have a beginner's mind when we're interacting with people. We want to have a beginner's mind when we're interacting with the entrenched narratives of our families, uh, with our entrenched narratives about who we are and what we are. Um, so, so intimate not knowing helps us open our minds and our hearts to a bigger picture, bigger view that can be put into practice and bring into awareness how the smaller, limiting, limiting ego-focused views we have to be abandoned. And even with that, realizing sometimes that all views in a particular moment can be a pediment to any type of So let's put it in vernacular. A fixed view can be seen as a cognitive bias. So what is a cognitive bias? It's a mistaken reasoning um, of evaluating and remembering or other cognitive process. And it often occurs because we're clinging to a preference and a belief, regardless of contrary information. Okay? Right now, this is playing out in our country in, a, in a, an amazing way. Um, and it's, I think it's an unintended consequence, unintended consequence of a whole bunch of other factors that come in our, our society. We, the funny thing is, we always think somebody else has a cognitive bias, and we don't. And he has the funny thing. <coughs> you cannot not have a cognitive bias. The only people that don't have cognitive bias are awakened Buddha. Well, uh, maybe the bird out there. Don't get me out. Okay? So we have to even be aware of that we have cognitive bias. And there are over a hundred identified cognitive biases. Okay? Some of them are, are very serious cognitive biases. Some of them are kind of interesting, like the idea of cognitive bias. Mm -hmm. That things you put together seem to have more value than things that are already. I don't know what to do with that one. That is the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking. I don't think so. But see, that may not be one that we have. 
We all have different, and we have layers of cognitive bias on cognitive bias. And yet we are so sure what somebody's thinking. We are so sure that my sister did this because this and this and this. Or that person cut me off in traffic because this or this or this. Or anybody who's a Republican or anybody who's a Democrat is this or this or this. Or anybody who's this kind of Buddhist or that kind of Oh, if somebody's a religious Buddhist, they're whack. If somebody's a secular Buddhist, oh, they're just like me. Okay? These fixed views cause suffering and create division among people. Um, so here's the thing, and this is straight from the, the words of the Buddha, from the, from the Pali. Um, the Buddha warns us about these cognitive biases. He calls it wrong view. When a person has wrong view, wrong resolve, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong <laughs> livelihood, wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, wrong concentration, wrong knowledge, wrong release, whatever bodily deed he undertakes in line with that view, whatever verbal deeds, whatever mental deed he undertakes in that line with that view, Whatever intentions, whatever determinations, whatever <laughs> vows, whatever fabrication, all lead to what is disagreeable, unpleasant, unappealing, unprofitable, and so our perspective, our paradigm, shapes everything. Because we don't see the world as it is, <laughs> we see the world as we are, the filter of that. Paradigm. And ultimately, what Buddhist practice is is about shifting of that paradigm. I can't help but think um, of Buddha's uh, first words when he you know, first started coming into enlightenment was that often we go back to our ignorance. You know, and, and in the first paragraph of the opening, I mean, I just can't help but think of transcending the boundaries of a delusive self. Liberating, liberate from the superiority, inferiority, and equality. Those are all fixed views of self. Yeah, ignorance, ignorance, or misperception. Um, um, so, has so think about your life, especially those who who have a few years under their belt. Um, think about changes in perspective in your own life. Think about all the things you knew were true when you were 20. Okay? How many perspectives? So here's the thing. I've never told anybody. So uh, I'm a return missionary. I've told people that. When I came home from my mission, I was a security guard at the team there. And I was still wanting um, to be a uh, and um, I was very conservative. I would listen to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you can still be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and for those like Rush Limbo, go, what's wrong with that? I was <laughs> um, And it was the Gulf War I, the first war, and I made my own bumper stickers. Uh, <laughs> And it was a very fixed view because of, not because I had any real opinion I thinking about, about what was going on. They wanted to be a good, Latter-day Saint young man. And that was the way Latter-day Saint men thought. So I thought to be a good Latter-day Saint, I had to think the same way. Um, and that's true about anything that you think you have to be a certain way to be a certain way. Okay. Um, and that is so not me. And I think one of the things that the Buddha was teaching is that everything is constantly changing. And there is no fixed self. Okay? You are constantly changing. And the older you get, the more aware you become of that. You look back and you can remember, I was there, I have these memories, but that's not me. Not even close to me. It's really weird. It's like my quadruple cis brother, you know. <laughs> and I happened to like dump into his brain one day, and 
came out. Wow. Um, and the funny thing is we get so attached to these views of self that are inherently I mean, imagine three years ago, four years ago, that you would be going to visit your lover in Greece. He would have said, you're insane. Just like this. <laughs> so we think it's attachment to, like, my car and my house, and those are, those are problematic. But really, the intimate thing, that we deal with every day are our attachment to our perception of who we are, who other people are, and that we have control over ourselves, control over others. And these thick views, these wrong perceptions of reality, cause us to go down so many blind alleys, and so many holes. We wonder, how did I get here? Why am I here? How did I get here? <laughs> but only yesterday, I was telling you that mm -hmm. of course, like every cell in our body that so we we aren't the body aren't for thought of a little bit of guilt goes. You've forgotten when you were twenty what you got. So it's an interesting Yeah, and it's it's interesting too because our 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 thoughts of our I'm not aware of the moment. Just aware of the moment. And only outside of it. And our body is attached to it. And really, the fixed view, fixed view on how it's supposed to be. We we're fixed, attached to the story. The same teacher who says life is disappointing, but you don't have to be disappointed by life. The last part of that comes back to this note. We get disappointed in life. What life is, how it is. We're not open to creative opportunity that comes with not knowing. The jazz musician, when they're improv improvising, they don't know what's coming next. That's the beauty of it. They intuit. They're open. They're they're not they're not attached to the previous one. Does my note match the In fact, one of the beautiful things about jazz from a music theory point is important. that there is this ability to react and to, to, to respond to life from a creative, a co-creator aspect of my existence, not to be fixed to all these stories that I have inherited. When I think about fixing something, I had a friend who sold fixative. What are fixative? Anybody know what a fixative is? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's glue. Yeah. <laughs> it's glue for the most part. A fix. Okay, so there's fixatives in Mountain Dew. Anybody drink Mountain Dew? If you didn't have a fixative in Mountain Dew, it would be separated. They're just really close thing on the bottom, the clear part on top. Fixative it fixes everything in place. Okay, fixatives are glue. Fixative for a for a butterfly is a pin through it on a board. Okay. Does anybody want to be that? Yet we, we chase after these things 
these fixed views, these fixed ideas, because they give us a false sense of security. It's important to remember that only dead things are fixed. Living things are dynamic. Views are produced by and in turn produced through conditional and habitual thinking. We may think that our views are logical and objective, and they are chosen, but they are really symptoms of our conditioning, our misperceptions, and our habitual thinking. In many ways, this is true bondage, the prison of perpetual reaction. We want to remember that any attachment to views, ideas, concepts, propositions is considered a fixed view. The Buddha counseled that any fixed view is ultimately false and reality is beyond any such. Because of this view at its heart, nothing that is conceptual in the thinker's mind is real. Ultimately, it is the shadow of reality. One way to address this tendency towards our attraction to fixed views and cognitive biases is meditation. Meditation is a practice of letting go of such things. When you sit, what what fixed what fixed ideas do you have when you sit? What's your expectation when you do sitting meditation? Right, you're gonna My fall asleep. Gonna fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> good, yeah, good. What else? My expectation that my mind will be. My mind won't wander. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna meditate so my mind doesn't wander. Okay. How many? <laughs> how many have got to that point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Huh? Uh, actually, you said to, to notice that your mind wandered, not for your mind not. Okay, because it's inherent. In the, the fabric of the mind, to wander. Okay, it's our ability to come back to the moment, to let go of the thread of the mind, to observe how the mind. Works. What other preconceptions do you have, or fixed views do you have about meditation? It's going to fix things. Okay, that, that's a good one. Yeah, it's going to make you feel better. Uh, oh yeah, it'll calm me down. What else? They'll give you answers. What else? They'll help you sleep. But maybe not the right. <laughs> um, I, I have to sit to be awakened. I have to sit to be a Buddha. And if I'm sitting to be a Buddha, it sure in the hell ain't working. Because I should be a better person. Meditation will make me a better person. That's another big thing. Okay? What are your fixed ideas when you don't meditate? Because there's a reason why you're not meditating. And I would say there's some fixed views there. Why no. don't you meditate? I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time to meditate. Good. What else? I'm a bad Buddhist. I'm a bad <laughs> Buddhist. Okay. Very good. What else? I'm not doing what I should be doing. It doesn't work for me. Good. What else? Okay. What Too else? Hard. Too hard. These are all fixed views. We have fixed views about our sitting, and we have fixed views on why we don't do our sitting. Okay? Especially if we're not doing it. Okay? So, one of the things about meditation is to let go of our fixed views about anything. About meditation itself. Well, I mean, but the concept in doing it, things happen. I mean, they really do. You know, anxiety, you know, depression, things like that. The view of the world around you can actually happen. So, but if you're holding on to it to create that, then it generally doesn't. Because you're slightly trying to follow it. And you're not a cat. Yeah. Isn't that great? But you're not on the path. Yeah. It's the paradox within within the Buddhist view. Purposeless, purposefulness. Effortless effort. Right? It's all the same idea 
that you meditate. So here's the thing, and I would challenge um, a lot of you, or all of you, um, to come to our, our Wednesday meditation. Um, our practice, reflection, thinking about the Buddhist teaching, being ethical as a Buddhist, being respected and important, so is meditation is important. So why it's important to come to an exploring mindfulness class is so we can start letting go of those fixed views. Those fixed views of how meditation should be, or those fixed views we have of why we don't do meditation. Um, one of the things that I would say about meditation is that it's pretty straightforward. Practice is just returning to the present moment. It's putting down the thread of thought that you went. It's not about going into your mind and being blissed out, although that could be an after effect of it. But that's not why you do it. You do it to lay down thought. As you wander somewhere else, practice is coming back to the moment. That is the practice. Even if you do it a thousand times, ten minutes, that's mm -hmm. the practice. You do it once in ten minutes, that's the practice. One's not better than the other. One is not more awakened than the other. Because the practice is the returning. Okay? Um, I want to share something with you in closing. I'm going to pause for a little little. Um, this is from Zen Kai Blanc Hartman, and she became abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center, um, which was started by Suzuki Roshi. She says, as Suzuki Roshi said in the prologue to Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, the expert there are a few. An expert, as an expert, you've already got it figured out, so you don't need to pay attention to what's happening. How can we cultivate this mind that is free to just be awake? In meditation, it's just sitting. In sitting and noticing the busyness of our mind, all of our fixed views that we carry. Once we notice the fixed views that we are carrying around with us, preconceptions that we carry around with us, then it's possible for us to let go and say, well, maybe so, maybe not. Suzuki Roshi once said, the essence of Zen is not always so. Not always so is a good little phrase to carry around when you're sure. It gives you an opportunity to look again more carefully and see what other possibilities there might be in this situation. Open up yourself. The only closest sense it says, to live a creative life. A little bit of but I challenge you as you go forth in this week to be open, be intimate with not knowing, and to see those six views you have or those things that you really are attached to, really attached to, and say, maybe not create that space within you. Be open, be responsive. Namo Amida Let's go to our...